started now. So we're happy to have uh, House Week Kevin Duanmu, who's a postdoc here at Berkeley, uh, talking on non-standard decision theory. This is joint with uh, Dan Roy of University of Toronto, and it's a paper that's forthcoming in the Annals of Statistics. So go ahead, Kevin. Uh, thank you, Bob, for your invitation. I've been in Berkeley for uh, two or three years working with uh, Bob, and uh, this is uh, my work from my uh, PhD dissertation. So uh, I will start by uh, giving an overview of today's talk. So, uh, so, uh, so uh, one of the uh, oldest and the most fundamental uh, problem in, in decision theory is raised by uh, Abraham Ward about 80 years ago. And it is on the connection up, uh, between uh, frequentist optimality and uh, Bayesian optimality. And there exists a huge literature on this problem, but most of existing uh, literatures are subject to technical conditions. And uh, in today's talk, uh, I will show that uh, we resolve this problem under complete generality using uh, non-standard analysis. And I will also mention that this is the starting point of a program to rework the foundation of uh, statistical uh, decision theory. So I shall start by uh, give a, a brief introduction to uh, standard uh, statistical decision theory. So usually a statistical decision problem consists of the following ingredients. So uh, first a sample space uh, X and a parameter space theta and an action space A. So a sample space consists of all the uh, observable data, and, uh, prim uh, and uh, parameter space theta denotes the uh, states of nature, and action space A denotes the set of all actions that are available to the statistician. And also we have a loss function, which is a, a, a function from theta times A to the uh, non-negative real line. So uh, this basically says if given a uh, uh, state of uh, nature, for example, element theta from uh, theta, and then action A, what's the loss incurred by uh, making uh, action A if the true state is uh, theta. And finally, uh, we have a, a model P theta, which, which is simply a family of uh, probability measures on the sample space X indexed by the parameter space uh, Theta. So here we use uh, M1x to denote the set of all probability measures on the uh, sample space X. So a randomized, uh, so roughly speaking, a decision procedure uh, will be a mapping from, uh, from uh, sort of like the sample space to action space. So basically it says that if you observe some, something, then uh, what actions will, you, uh, will the st statistician take? based on his observation. So we now give a rigorous definition. So, so, uh, so uh, the rigorous definition of a randomized decision procedure is a map delta from X to M1A. So M1A denotes the set of probability measures on the action space. So uh, basically a randomized decision procedure uh, says that if I observe some data from a sample space, then uh, delta provides a rule of how to, how to choose uh, how to make actions randomly in the uh, action space A. And the decision procedure delta is non-randomized if uh, uh, for every uh, x in x, delta x is a degenerate measure uh, 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 on the uh, action space A. And we shall use uh, uh, delta x A to denote this uh, delta x parenthesis A, and we use D to denote the class of all randomized decision procedures. So how do we measure the goodness of decision procedures? So the goodness of decision procedures is usually characterized by the following concept, which we call risk. So uh, if delta is a decision procedure, the risk of delta at a particular uh, point theta in the parameter space theta is denoted by R theta delta, and it, and it is defined by this double integration. So the uh, inner integration is over the uh, randomized decision procedure uh, uh, is uh, with respect to this uh, randomized decision procedure delta x over the set of all possible actions. And the outer integral is taken uh, uh, with respect to the, uh, to the model at theta, p theta. So uh, roughly speaking, we want to pick a decision procedure with uh, the smallest risk 
at every point in the parameter space. But this is usually uh, impossible. So uh, uh, in, in the literature, people come up with two uh, 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 most com um, mostly common used uh, criteria for um, optimality. So the first one, the f uh, the first notion of uh, of optimality is called admissibility. So suppose I have two decision procedures, delta and delta prime in D, and let C be a subset of D. And we say that uh, the decision procedure delta is absolutely dominated by delta prime if the risk of delta prime is everywhere less or equal to the risk of delta minus epsilon, and there exists a theta zero in the parameter space, such as the risk of delta prime is less than the risk of delta minus epsilon. And we say delta is epsilon admissible in C if there's no decision procedure in delta prime that epsilon dominates delta. And we say that delta is admissible if delta is zero admissible. So that, so that means that uh, there's nothing dominates delta. And we say that delta is extended admissible if delta is epsilon admissible for all positive epsilon. So it is easy to see that among these four notions, admissibility is the strongest notion and extended admissibility is the second uh, strongest uh, notion. So in this talk, we will primarily working with the notion of uh, extended admissible. So uh, clearly admissible implies uh, extended admissible. So, okay, so uh, here uh, is, uh, uh, is the graphical intuition of uh, admi admissibility. So uh, suppose we are considering a decision procedure and I, I, I will let the uh, X coin to denote the set of, uh, to denote the parameter space theta and the Y axis denote the, the non-negative real line. And suppose we are considering um, four decision procedures, delta zero, delta one, delta two, and delta three. And uh, uh, I also uh, draw their uh, risk functions uh, on this graph. So here uh, we can see that uh, delta zero, epsilon dominates delta one for some uh, positive epsilon, because if we look at the risk functions of delta zero and delta one, and we see that uh, the risk of delta zero is everywhere less than the risk of delta one for some epsilon. And if we consider uh, only uh, the decision procedures delta one, delta two, and delta three, we then see that uh, uh, delta one uh, dominates delta three because the risk of, uh, of uh, delta one is everywhere less than or equal to the risk of uh, delta three. However, if we, uh, however, uh, if we only consider uh, decision procedures delta two and delta three, then we can see they are generally incomparable because for some portion of the parameter space, the risk of delta three is less than the risk of delta two. But for other portions of the parameter space, the risk of delta two is less than the risk of delta three. So if we stick with uh, 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 admissibility, then we cannot distinguish from delta two and delta three. So we don't know which one to pick. However, suppose I have some prior uh, knowledge that the true parameter theta lies in the uh, relatively uh, left portion of the parameter space. So here, I will mark here with theta then uh, we can see that at this particular point theta, the risk of delta, uh, the risk of delta two is less than the risk of delta three. So, uh, uh, so if I uh, if I have such a prior knowledge, then I will choose uh, delta two over delta three. So this gives rise to uh, the Bayes notion, the Bayesian notion of uh, optimality, known as uh, Bayes optimality. So uh, here. Again, uh, let delta be a um, uh, randomized decision procedure from D and let C be a subset of D. So a prior is simply a probability measure on the parameter space theta. And the Bayes risk of delta with respect to, to a prior pi is denoted by R power pi delta and it is the uh, average, uh, it's the expected risk of delta with respect to the uh, prior uh, distribution pi. And we say that delta is Bayes optimal among C under a prime pi, if the uh, Bayes risk of delta is less than infinite, and the, and the Bayes risk of delta is less or equal to the Bayes risk of delta prime for all delta prime in C. And we simply say delta is Bayes optimal among C if delta is Bayes among C under some prime pi. 
So the most fundamental uh, question of uh, statistical decision theory, which is raised 80 years ago, ago by Abraham Ward is, uh, is the following. What is the connection between uh, admissibility and uh, Bayes optimality? So as I said, there has been a huge, uh, there has been a huge literature on this problem. And there were many uh, famous people, including uh, von Neumann, Abraham Ward, uh, Lucien Lacan, uh, Stein, uh, Larry Brown, uh, a lot of top statisticians work on the problem uh, in the uh, 50s to uh, 80s. Uh, and they provide uh, various extensions of the uh, result to uh, infinite pr uh, parameter space. Uh, but most of them are subject to uh, technical conditions. So here I will summarize a few uh, key results in the uh, literature. So uh, the first uh, Lemma basically says a decision procedure is Bayes, then it is extended admissible. This is uh, obvious from the definition because uh, if the decision procedure is not extended admissible, then it must be epsilon dominated by some other decision procedure for some uh, positive epsilon. So it cannot be Bayes. So the, this first lemma holds for every decision problem. Uh, so the first uh, uh, important theorem is by uh, Abraham Ward which says that if the parameter space is uh, finite, then uh, delta zero is admissible, implies it is Bayes. Actually here we can replace, one can replace admissible by extended uh, admissible and gets an equivalence between uh, extended admissible and Bayes for decision, pro uh, for decision problems with finite parameter space. So uh, the next theorem is uh, extension towards theorem to, uh, to uh, compact to uh, decision problems with compact parameter space and the continuous risk functions. So uh, we will later uh, derive this result as a corollary for our, uh, from our main theorem. So this theorem says that if the parameter space is compact and risk functions are continuous, uh, decision procedure is uh, then admissibility implies uh, Bayes optimality. Again, uh, here one can replace admissibility by uh, extended admissibility, and one would uh, uh, get uh, equivalence between uh, extended admissibility and Bayes optimality. So uh, the third theorem is by uh, Sutterson and Hees, uh, published in the Annals of Statistics in 1978, uh, which says that if the uh, parameter space is measurable and risk functions are bounded, then uh, extended admissible um, if and only if it is a uh, finitely additive Bayes. So that means it is Bayes with respect to a finitely additive prime. So I must mention that uh, for decision procedures with uh, infinite parameter space, the, uh, the equivalence between uh, uh, extended admissibility or admissibility and Bayes optimality becomes fragile. In particular, uh, in the uh, normal location problems, one uh, the um, maximum likelihood estimator is admissible, but it is not Bayes with, with respect to any prior. However, it is Bayes with respect to the uh, Lebesgue measure on the uh, whole real line. So this shows that uh, uh, if one uh, wants to go beyond the finite parameters, uh, parameter space setting, one must relax the notion of uh, Bayes optimality by considering a larger class of priors that means not just probability measures to regain such equivalence between uh, Bayes optimality and uh, uh, frequentist optimality. So uh, first of all, uh, I will give a, a very quick graphical proof of a worst result on finite parameter space, because later on I will give a, a proof on our main non-standard theorem, right? and I want to, I, I, and I want to uh, uh, show the, uh, uh, similarity between uh, these two uh, proofs. So, okay, so suppose the parameter space is uh, finite, then we assume the parameter space consists of n points, namely uh, theta one, theta two, up to theta n. So given any decision procedure delta, its risk is characterized by the uh, risk vector, basically uh, r theta one delta, r theta two delta, up to r theta n delta. So uh, if I collect all decision procedures, then I will get my uh, risk set, which I denoted by S. And this S is a convex uh, subset of the n-dimensional Euclidean space. On the other hand, given a decision procedure delta zero, 
or delta, I could consider is lower quantum, which is the collection of all points in the n-dimensional Euclidean space, such that each coordinate of the point is less or equal to uh, the risk of delta zero at the corresponding uh, theta k. Uh, this set is, uh, is, of course, a convex set. So if delta zero is admissible or extended ad admissible, uh, its risk vector will be on the uh, lower boundary of the uh, risk set. In particular, its lower quintent will only intersect the risk set at one point, namely the uh, risk vector of uh, delta zero. So uh, by separation uh, hyperplane theorem, one can find a, a hyperplane that's, that separates the uh, lower quantum of delta zero and uh, the risk set. And one can also show the supporting vector of such hyperplane uh, is, uh, has non-negative coordinate everywhere. So uh, after normalization, uh, this supporting vector will, uh, will uh, can be seen as a prior to witness the Bayes optimality of delta zero. So can this proof can, is, yeah, yeah. Can I just make a comment? So this picture should be familiar to the economists in the audience. It's a picture for the proof of the second welfare theorem um, in uh, graduate micro class. And uh, it of course, you know, as in Kevin's argument, it relies on the uh, separating hyperplane theorem. Okay, so thank you, Bob. And one can easily see that uh, such argument uh, breaks down uh, if one uh, if one goes beyond the uh, finite setting because we no longer have this hyperplane uh, separation theorems. So uh, so as I said, you know, various attempts have been made uh, in the literature, and uh, people make all kinds of uh, assumptions. For example, one consider uh, decision problems where the model is uh, comes from exponential family, or one assume various of regularity conditions on the uh, on the models, on the risk functions, on the loss functions to obtain general, uh, which people call complete class theorems, which basically is about the connections between uh, frequencies and Bayes optimalities for decision problems with infinite parameter space. So here we will take a different approach by using a non-standard analysis. So, okay, so uh, I, so, okay, so uh, the following uh, graph is a general uh, um, algorithm uh, that, that is behind many of my research uh, papers, not just on uh, these projects on uh, decision problems, but also on my um, my projects on uh, Markov processes, and uh, also on my uh, recent works with uh, Bob Ali and uh, Matting on general equilibrium theorem. So uh, I will give a short explanation on this uh, on, on, on this graph. So su suppose one is interested in some standard infinite structure such that its uh, finite counterpart is well known and uh, one wants to get an answer for the uh, standard infinite uh, problem. So what, what one do is we first uh, push up to consider the uh, corresponding problem in the uh, non-standard structure. So within the non-standard structure, there's a, a typical kind of objects, which is known as the hyperfinite objects, uh, which I will introduce later. So hyperfinite objects are uh, technically infinite mathematical object, but they preserve all the first order logic properties as finite uh, objects. So uh, since, the, since in the standard structure, the finite counterpart of the result is well known, we can get a hyperfinite theorem in the uh, non-standard structure, which I denoted by the non-standard theorem. Uh, however, on the other hand, the non-standard structure is constructed from the standard structure so, uh, so with some regularity conditions, one can usually push down the non-standard theorem to obtain a standard infinite theorem uh, that we were originally looking for. So, okay. So uh, now I will give a, a very rough uh, introduction to a uh, non-standard analysis. So uh, the starting point of non-standard analysis uh, so, uh, is, uh, uh, well, you know, noise analysis was introduced by Abraham Robinson in the 1960s, and uh, its starting point is the construction of the non standard real line. So, here's the uh, rough drawing of the non standard real line, and uh, 
Um, so it looks very much like the standard real line, but if one has a microscope and look around point zero, then there will be infinitesimals such as uh, negative epsilon or positive epsilon. And uh, the collection of all infinitesimals is called a monad around zero, and we usually denote it by an ST inverse zero. And then we, if we look at somewhere else, for example, uh, 10 to the power of six, then there are also uh, non-standard real numbers which are infinitely close to uh, 10 to the power of six, such, at, uh, such as 10 to the power of six minus epsilon or 10 to the power of six plus epsilon. If one look at, look at the tails of the non-standard real line, then we will see uh, infinite numbers. Uh, for example, negative one over epsilon or one over epsilon. So uh, one might ask that, uh, what is the difference between a non-standard real line and for example, the extended real line where it's just a real line plus two elements, uh, negative, epsilon, uh, negative infinity and a positive infinity. So, dif so the difference is that uh, is, 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 uh, is, is behind the first nice property of the, uh, of the non-standard real line, which is a transfer principle. So the transfer principle says that uh, uh, the truth value of any uh, first order logic statement is preserved when going uh, from uh, the standard real line to the non-standard real line and vice versa. So for example, if I have two uh, standard real numbers, A and B, then in the standard real line, I know that A plus B equals to B plus A. So the same remains true in the non-standard real line. So for any two non-standard real numbers, I have A plus B equals to uh, B plus A. Uh, so such such nice algebraic uh, properties is not preserved for the standard uh, for the extended real line because simply you cannot view a negative inf infinite and a positive infinite as other uh, standard uh, real numbers. You can't you know sum over them. You can't take product of them with other uh, with other uh, numbers. Uh, so, uh, so Bob and uh, Ward might be uh, might not be uh, very satisfying because I omit the uh, so-called saturation principle. But uh, uh, I I think you know the saturation property is a is a is a is a bit abstract. So I omit that uh, uh, in in this talk, but uh, instead I introduce the uh, existence of infinite and infinite decimal numbers just. To, just to make sure the rest of the audience get a better picture of uh, what the non-standard real line is. So uh, the existence of infinite and infinitesimal numbers basically says that there exists um, uh, non-standard real numbers such that its absolute value is greater than n for every natural number. And uh, by the transfer principle, it's reciprocal. Uh, the absolute value of its reciprocal is less than one over n for, uh, for every uh, natural number n. So for two uh, elements x, y in star r, we say that they are infinitely close and we write x approximately equals to y if the absolute value between uh, x and my, uh, x minus y is infinitesimal. So uh, such construction of the non-standard real line can be extended to uh, any topological space. Uh, for example, it can be clearly extended to metric space and uh, uh, the uh, distance uh, and you know where the distance between two points can be defined naturally. So uh, what I want to say is that uh, this non-standard non construction applies to any set, not just the uh, real line. So now I will introduce a, partic uh, uh, a particularly important class of uh, objects from, uh, from the non-standard universe, namely the uh, hyperfinite objects. So a set A uh, is hyperfinite if and only if there exists an internal bijection between A to uh, 0, 1 up to n minus 1 for some infinite natural number n. So uh, as I said before, a hyperfinite set is technically an infinite set, but it has all the uh, first order logic properties as a finite set. So uh, a hyperfinite probability space is simply a triple uh, omega i omega p, uh, such that omega is a hyperfinite set, and i omega is a collection of all hyperfinite subsets of omega. And P is then function from I omega to star zero one such that uh, P empty set equals to zero, P omega equals to one, and P is hyperfinite additive. So once again, a hyperfinite probability space behaves behaves very much like a finite probability space. Okay, so uh, hyperfinite probability space is interesting because uh, it can be used to uh, represent uh, standard probability space, and uh, uh, Bob has certainly done a lot of work on this. So I will give a 
the simplest example uh, just to illustrate the power of a hyperfinite probability space. So suppose uh, n is some uh, infinite natural number and I let t uh, be the set one over n, two over n up to one. So t is a hyperfinite set with uh, cardinality n. And for every element omega in t, I let p omega equals to uh, one over n. So uh, such t is called a, a hyperfinite uniform, uh, a uniform hyperfinite probability space. So this uh, hyperfinite probability space can be used to uh, represent the Lebesgue measure on the unit interval zero one, namely, uh, well, actually informally and incorrectly, but uh, in intuitively, the Lebesgue measure of a set A of a of a set A is the same as counting the number of points in T that are infinitely close to some points in A. So uh, such representation ideas not only applies to a probability. Uh, like simple probability space such as such as Lebesgue measures on zero one, it also applies to uh, uh, other like to stochastic processes, to uh, Markov processes, to uh, economics. Uh, this is really the key of applying uh, nonsense analysis to solve standard problems. So okay. So we now uh, introduce the uh, non-standard Bayes optimality. So this is a notion of uh, Bayes optimality introduced by us. And uh, uh, this will uh, surprisingly, this notion of, we will show that this notion of optimality is equivalent to uh, the frequentist notion of uh, optimality. So uh, suppose Delta is a standard randomized decision procedure. So a hyperfinite prior is simply a, our star probability measure on uh, on star theta, where star theta is a non-standard extension of theta with hyperfinite support. So the non-standard Bayes risk of delta under a hyperfinite prior pi is uh, denoted by this uh, 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 non-standard integration of uh, uh, star delta uh, of the star risk of uh, star delta on um, star theta with respect to the uh, hyperfinite prior pi. So we see that delta is a non-standard Bayes among C under a hyperfinite prior pi if, it's, uh, if the uh, non-standard Bayes risk of delta is less than or infinitely close to the uh, non-standard Bayes risk of uh, delta prime uh, under pi for all other delta prime in C. So we see that delta is non-standard Bayes among C if delta is non-standard Bayes among C under some hyperfinite prior pi. So we now present our main result. So our main result says that uh, a decision procedure is extended admissible if and only if it is non-standard Bayes. So this theorem holds under complete generality. It holds for any decision problems. We don't even have to impose any uh, topological condition on the uh, sample space or on the uh, action space. Hence, we believe that uh, this theorem really uh, reveals the deepest connection between uh, frequentist optimality and the Bayesian optimality, hence uh, resolving this 80-year-old uh, problem completely. So here, uh, I will give a very quick uh, non-standard proof of our main result, and one would see that uh, why is this proof uh, close in spirit uh, as, a finite, as a finite proof. So first of all, we will use uh, saturation, which is uh, uh, a, a, a property you know uh, that that is built in from the non-standard structure but uh, but was not introduced by me so uh, by saturation we can always pick up a hyperfinite set T theta uh, which we denote by T1 T2 up to TK that contains the original parameter space theta as a as a um, as a subset so for any uh, decision procedure delta zero we will define its n lower quintent to be the set of all points in this hyperfinite dimensional star Euclidean space such that each xk is less or equals to the star risk of, of uh, delta zero at tk minus one over n. So uh, here will be a, a sequence of rough drawing of uh, n dimensional, uh, n lower quintent. So you can see that uh, this sequence of uh, and dimensional uh, and lower quantum approaches to the uh, hyperfinite risk set. So uh, by extended admissibility, uh, uh, sorry, so note that each and lower quantum is uh, 
uh, uh, convex. And the hyperfinite risk set is also convex and they are disjoint from each other. So uh, this follows from uh, extended admissibility. Hence, uh, by the transfer of the hyperplane separating theorem, there will be a hyperplane separating each n lower quantum and the hyperfinite risk set. Then by saturation, there will there exists a hyperplane separating the union of all n lower quantum and the risk set. And once again, show that the supporting vector of this uh, uh, final hyperplane pi is uh, has non-negative coordinates everywhere. So uh, after normalization, this can be viewed as a hyperfinite prior that witnesses the non-standard Bayes optimality of uh, delta zero. So okay. So um, as a non-standard analyst, uh, uh, our main theorem looks very uh, satisfying to me because uh, uh, it established the, uh, the uh, uh, equivalence between uh, frequentist and uh, Bayesian optimality under a complete generality. But I understand that uh, for most of the uh, mathematicians and the statisticians, uh, they're interested in a standard result. So uh, for, the, uh, for, for the rest of my talk, I will uh, explain how to push down our uh, non-standard main result to obtain purely standard result for, a standard, deci uh, for standard decision problems. Uh, so uh, so uh, to obtain purely standard results, this, this is based on uh, pushing down a hyperfinite priors to get a standard price. So, uh, so here we uh, assume theta to be a Hausdorff space endowed with a Borel schema algebra B theta, and let p be uh, and let pi be a non-standard probability measure on star theta. So uh, we can construct. Uh, uh, first of all, we can always construct a countably additive measure, uh, pi subscript p on theta b theta. So pi subscript p uh, is, usually denote, uh, is usually called the pushdown of pi. So if theta is compact, then the pushdown uh, can be taken to be a probability measure. So this pushdown is uh, usually constructed from the standard part map. So for uh, this is for those who are interested in the uh, non-standard construction. And uh, uh, secondly, uh, one can always construct a finitely additive probability measure Pi superscript pi, uh, pi superscript p uh, on uh, the original parameters space theta b theta. So this pi superscript p is uh, is called the internal pushdown of pi. So uh, the internal pushdown is always a probability measure. That means its total mass always equals to one. It's always equals to one. But uh, in many cases, it will only be uh, finitely additive, not uh, countably additive. So I will give a simple. Uh, I, will, I will give the following simple example uh, on a pushdown and internal pushdown. Again, let n be an infinite natural number, and let pi be an internal probability measure concentrating on uh, one over n. So the pushdown simply gives us the uh, degenerate measure on the uh, point zero, and the internal pushdown gives us a finitely additive probability measure with uh, uh, pi superscript p zero, one over n equals to one for every natural number n. So, um, so yeah, so that's a simple example of a pushdown and the uh, internal pushdown. Okay, so as a following two, so, so we now uh, review some uh, connections between uh, a hyperfinite prior, it's a uh, uh, pushdown and it's internal pushdown. So the first theorem says that uh, if the parameter space is compact Hausdorff and the risk functions are continuous, then for any decision procedure delta and for any uh, internal probability measure on the uh, hyperfinite parameter space, the risk of uh, uh, delta zero with respect to the, the standard Bayes risk of delta zero with respect to the pushdown of pi is equal to the non-standard Bayes risk of delta zero with respect to the original internal probability measure pi up to an infinitesimal. Uh, so this, this theorem gives us the uh, connection between the, uh, the uh, original uh, internal probability measure and its pushdown. So the second theorem uh, reveals the connection between the uh, original probability measure and its internal pushdown. So the theorem says that if the risk functions are bounded and if pi is an internal probability measure on the hyperfinite parameter space, then the Bayes risk of delta zero with respect to the internal pushdown is equal 
to the non-standard Bayes risk of delta zero with respect to uh, the internal probability, uh, probability measure pi up to an infinitesimal. So with the help of these two results and our uh, main theorem, which uh, established the uh, equivalence between uh, extended admissible and non-standard Bayes for any decision problems, we obtain the following two purely standard results. So the first result says that if the parameter space is compact Hausdorff and the risk functions are continuous, then extended admissible uh, if and only if it is Bayes. So uh, this result was sort of known by uh, Abraham Ward back in the 1950s, but uh, in Instead of uh, uh, its extremely uh, simple uh, uh, presentation here, uh, Ward's proof relies on, on another uh, 12 technical conditions. For example, he requires a model to be uh, dominated and, uh, and, and so on. And we, we managed to get rid of, uh, rid of uh, all of them by, uh, by using a non analysis. So we also retrieved the second result, which is a famous result by uh, Sellers and Heath. And this result says that if the parameter space is measurable and risk functions are bounded, then extended admissible if and only if it is finally additive Bayes. So, okay, so now uh, we reach the uh, end of uh, our talk. So uh, in this talk, uh, I first defined the term of non-standard Bayes optimality, and I showed that uh, extended admissibility is equivalent to a non-standard Bayes optimality for all, decision, uh, for all decision problems. And we then established two uh, standard results using our uh, non-standard theorem. And as I said, this is the first step to, uh, to rebuild the foundation of statistical decision theory using a uh, non-standard analysis. So we actually already have uh, uh, several uh, upcoming works. So for example, uh, we established the existence of uh, matching priors for a uh, compact parameter space, extending a previous result by uh, Mueller and uh, Noretz uh, on finite parameter space. And uh, this result, and, and, and for this paper, we have just received a positive uh, uh, feedback from uh, Biometrica. And we are also uh, giving a uh, non-standard characterization of uh, admissibility instead of extended uh, admissibility. I think we have shown that uh, if the uh, loss function are strictly convex, then admissibility is equivalent to uh, being uniquely uh, non-standard Bayes. Uh, and we hope to use this uh, formulation to uh, resolve the, uh, uh, the famous problem on the uh, uh, Great deal uh, on the uh, great build deal estimator. So that is end of my talk. Uh, thank you all for listening. Okay, uh, I'll open up the floor for questions. Anyone? So let me ask a question about uh, how this has been received, Kevin. So this, okay. is, this is in your dissertation from about three years ago. And um, uh, you know it, what it does is it uh, really provides a significant improvement on a bunch of classical theorems that were done by famous people between 1920 and 1980 or so. Yeah. Um, um, but you got a initially somewhat hostile reception from at least one referee at Annals of Statistic who said basically, well, people don't do this anymore. And I'm just wondering uh, what you what you think about that situation. Um, um, that uh, you know this went out of fashion for a long time, but obviously you found a way to do a lot better than people had and. Uh, and uh, you know what does that say about uh, what uh, about the progress of scholarship? I don't know. It's a kind of open-ended question. Maybe you don't have uh, things you want to say, but I, I just wondered if you wanted to address it. Yeah. So uh, actually, you know, when we first submit uh, when we first submit, submitted this to the Annals of Stats, it was assigned to an AE, and the AE rejected uh, 
in two weeks saying that you know it's just uh, like no one cares about admissibility now and then uh, we uh, had a had us uh, and we uh, arranged for a Skype meeting with uh, the uh, the uh, editor at uh, that time and then he uh, gave it to uh, another more appropriate associate editor and which the paper eventually get uh, refereed and uh, for for extremely long periods usually I think Anos claims that, uh, that people will receive their first round report within three weeks to six weeks but it took that took them one and a half year to provide us a report and uh, they even ask us for a list of people who can who, who will be able to review the non-standard mathematics in this talk so i think you know there are still um, a group of people who are interested in uh, foundations of statistics uh, for example uh, i i uh, i uh, attend this uh, a BFF meeting uh, every year is called Bayesian Frequentist Fudu Show meeting run by uh, several prominent statisticians, including uh, the uh, Xiaoli Meng. He was the uh, graduate chair at uh, Harvard University. Uh, so I think you know this manuscript has to reach the right audience for them to appreciate its uh, value. So for example, like uh, Teddy Seidenfeld in CMU or Glenn Sheffer in uh, Rutgers Shaolin, uh, Harvard, I think they all like the paper, but uh, I have to admit that uh, uh, doing something which is uh, um, has this level of abstraction and uh, was, which, was, which is also a very classic topic uh, is probably not as popular as it is back in the 70s and 80s. And it's probably, you know, no, not fair to expect to, to, to expect it to be well received for everyone because Many people probably just just won't understand it uh, so well, uh, but uh, I I guess you know I find joy in this uh, in uh, working on such uh, classical problems mostly uh, because it's probably a matter of taste of uh, mathematics. So uh, yeah, so 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 yeah, so that was that will be my answer to to. to to your, to your question, yeah. Okay, are there other questions or comments? Well, just sort of following up on, on that theme a little bit, I wonder, Kevin, if you have uh, opinions about what are, the, what are the best sources of the basic mathematics of uh, the Robinson theme on standard analysis for you know explaining the the necessary background of this work uh, to to other people so economists but also mathematicians who are not say model theorists or not people who are closely familiar with these tech you know could quickly understand the technicalities because of what what they already understood uh yeah so uh I actually, you know, when I was when I when I picked up this uh, subject, I used the uh, uh, NATO series book from 1997. The uh, the one actually, you wrote the first chapter of that of of that book, a gen, a gentle introduction to uh, non analysis. Yes, I you, know that book. Yeah, so I I find that that book. Uh, Oh, I, I find that book very good. And essentially, I think you only need to learn the first four chapters, you know, to get yourself acquainted with uh, all the non-standard techniques and then move to uh, more advanced topics. Uh, if one see, uh, well, you know, uh, it really depends on one's uh, research area. Uh, but I think, you know, that book... Uh, it's not something like it's not something one can read uh, like in a couple of days because one have to have some knowledge in logic and uh, uh, have to pick up the. Uh, I think it took me at least like half a year to uh, to uh, to go through those four chapters. So I find uh, Isaac Goldbring's note, uh, the summer school note on non uh mm. quite uh, quite quite useful because he introduced in a very nice way. So he first. He, he didn't introduce the, the logic foundation first, but instead he sort of uh, tells you, like, you know, gives you a brief understanding of non analysis, and then he supports this with a lot of examples in a calculus. 
So I think, you know, uh, people will have, uh, so as people, so, so everybody knows calculus, so people will have some, 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 we'll, we'll build up some uh, intuitions uh, on nonsense analysis via working through many of the calculus problems before they move to more advanced topics such as uh, low measures or superstructures or things like that. So, I, could so you I think, say again what the what the notes were that uh, that went by fast and I didn't catch it precisely? Uh, it was written by uh, uh, Isaac Goldbrey. Oh yes. Uh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, he was he, he was our PhD student in Urbana, so I know Isaac very well. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, he wrote a very nice note. I think he. I think one can just search Isaac Goldbrey nonsense analysis on the uh, website and then it will pop up. I think it's from like a logic summer school in UCLA. Right, the, the, the logic group at UCLA, they did for several years. I'm not sure if it's still happening. They did um, organize a, a summer program a few weeks long and, and brought in uh, many undergraduate students and tried and they taught them different parts of logic. And the, that the year that Isaac gave lectures in non-standard analysis uh, was where these notes came from. And I'm pretty sure they're on his, his webpage at uh, University of California, Irvine. Yeah, yes. So he, writes, I think... he writes pretty well. He has a good sense of how to, uh, how to explain things. There are some other older um, things that aren't so well known that Keith Stroyan has written. Uh, he, he was a, a Keith Stroyan was uh, one of us from our generation, a little younger, more like Bob, I guess, uh, who was in on the heyday of non-standard analysis. And there's several books, advanced books of his, but he's, he has been pretty successful in bringing the ideas of infinitesimals into uh, basic mathematics, basic an analysis and calculus. Yeah. And um, I can't give precise uh, information, but there are a number of those that uh, it, he gives a, a very rich examples from classical mathematics how to, about solving differential equations and other, other things in basic analysis, explaining them using the ideas of infinitesimals. And there's also a calculus textbook that Jerry Kiesler wrote, which I think yes. is still available online. Yes. Uh, that a number of us use from time to time in, in teaching uh, just standard first and second semester calculus. Yes. So I, I think Bill Weiss also uh, taught uh, probably one time in his career calculus using that from that book. I also find there's a book called uh, Developments in Nonsense Analysis written by probably edited by uh, Nigel Cutlet. Uh, I find uh, as, as you know, Bob told me that's not a very usual book on everyone's shelf, but uh, I got it somehow from Amazon. You know, like just I probably just was 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 searching for some theorem, and uh, it sort sort of like pops up in that book, so I just purchased that book. Uh, I, I find that book relatively that's well. Edited, that's an edited volume. I probably know it, but I, it doesn't come to immediately to my memory. Yeah, it's called Developments in Non-Standard Mathematics or something like, like that. It, it has the words developments in its title. Is it fully yeah. authored by Nigel or is it a collection that he- uh, it's, a, it's a collection. Nigel was one of the editor. Yeah. Yeah, and also some, some, some or maybe probably one guy is from uh, Brazil, like, you know, I'm, 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 not, I'm, not, I'm not so sure, but he has a, like a Brazilian kind of name, but uh, I think the first uh, editor was Major Cutland, yeah. Okay, if um, you were looking uh, for a URL, uh, Ujin posted the URL to uh, so, uh, the first lecture notes that uh, Kevin mentioned. Uh, so you can yeah. get that in the chat. Um, sorry, uh, somebody else wanted to speak. Yeah, so, uh, yeah I, I, want, I want to ask a quick question. So um, very, very nice talk. Uh, I, I think like heuristically what's the non-standard analysis can bring in like beyond the original classical analysis of uh -huh. like uh, yeah okay okay yeah it's simple explain yeah okay so that's a very good question so uh so uh i think uh well yeah so i think technically speaking uh 
Nonsense analysis, the nonsense model was constructed from a ZFC, so uh, it does not have, so it, it, it does not rely on any uh, extra set theoretic axioms. Uh, so uh, technically speaking, everything that is provable by nonsense analysis can be proved by standard analysis and vice versa. However, I believe uh, Jerry Kiesler and Ward Henson, well, Ward is actually in the audience, and they wrote a paper on 1979, is that correct word? Like on the strengths of non analysis, which uh, they sort of explain the, uh, uh, I mean, I, I I didn't read that paper very carefully, but it was what uh, was on something like uh, usually in, uh, in, in, in the proof, uh, in a mathematical proof, one to not exploit the full power of ZFC, but only, uh, some, some something like a second order piano arithmetic or something like that. But I think Word will explain that much better than me. Uh, so I want to speak on something else, which is uh, uh, I think in uh, some of the uh, 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 papers in uh, mathematical economics, or for example, in uh, in my talk, uh, non analysis really offers a richer structure and that allows existence of certain object that does not exist in the uh, uh, standard model. Like for example, in, in my talk, uh, it, it sort of shows that uh, if, we, if we want to get an equivalence between some notion of frequentist optimality and Bayesian optimality, then one must go to the non-standard universe and to use this non-standard notion of Bayes op optimality to get such equivalence. And there are also similar results in uh, uh, mathematical economics uh, where uh, Nash equilibriums do not exist in the standard model, but they exist in the uh, lobe economy model. Actually, you know, Bob and I uh, and Ali and Metin, we are working on a, a paper on the existence of uh, free disposal and non-free disposal uh, equilibriums in the uh, Mauritian model. And we show that if we start with a standard uh, economic model, uh, the, the, the standard economic model may not uh, have uh, free disposal or non-free disposal equilibriums, but if we go to its uh, corresponding non-standard model, then there exists uh, free disposal or non-free disposal equilibriums. So I think uh, uh, in terms of proofs, uh, I, I would say all the, uh, all the results that, that is proved by standard analysis can be proved by non analysis and vice versa. But there are certain results, especially existence result uh, that requires the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, 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 the uh, like the, Existence is really in the uh, non-standard structure, but, but but not in the standard structure. So I think th this is really uh, uh, what non-standard st analysis offers beyond standard analysis. Uh, I see. Yeah, that gives me something to think about. So another related related question, like if if I'm a for example frequentist, I, I only care about some like frequentist uh, optimality, right? For example, like mm -hmm. minimax optimality. Yeah. Why, why should I care about uh, corresponding like a Bayesian sense? Because uh, that would depends on the prior, a lot of other things. Uh, well, actually, uh, uh, this sort of like, uh, like what, what I showed in this talk is that uh, it really doesn't matter whether you're a, like a frequentist or a Bayesian, because even if you're a frequentist, uh, 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 even if you're a, a frequentist and you care about uh, frequentist optimality, there, there will be a prior such that uh, uh, a Bayesian will uh, agree with you. And uh, I think really uh, if one is doing uh, uh, like, like, you know, if one is using a statistical uh, decision theory to uh, to to really handle some uh, 
uh, uh, uh, uh, practical examples, I don't think one can really just be a, a frequentist optimum because what f- because fre- frequentist optimality basically is admissibility, right? But admissibility is really really weak. For example, uh, if I'm if I'm just a frequentist, then I can choose a constant decision procedure. So a constant decision procedure basically says that no matter what I observe, I will uh, like I will I will I will do the same, right? So for example, in an estimation problem, I could I could say like no matter what I observe, I will always just just pick the parameter C So uh, this 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 decision procedure sounds looks very stupid, but it is actually admissible because uh, although I might perform horribly at all other points, but I perform perfectly at uh, one point, namely when the parameter when when the, when the real parameter is theta, because at that point my risk is zero. So that means that. I'm not dominated by anything because uh, for other decision procedures, it will perform worse than me on that, on that just one point. Although I, at, at other points, th- those decision procedures will outperform me. So, uh, but if I'm, I'm just a frequentist, then uh, I cannot distinguish this decision procedure with other decision procedures because it is also admissible. So one sometimes really have to do, have to be Bayesian uh, by picking uh, reasonable priors and look at one's uh, uh, Bayes risk to uh, really judge like what decision procedures to pick. So uh, that will be my answer to a second question. Yeah, I kind of I kind of disagree about the your last statement. Like we have to be Bayes and to distinguish. Like so 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 one thing is the misabilities is like. Because um, I I will I will definitely like be as naive as choosing a constant, just yeah. allow that to be at the mean speed. But like if, if I if I kind of uh, go to like minimax optimality. Mm-hmm. But um, mini but mini max optimality is really also a very uh, conservative criteria, right? Because it only tells you like but but because when mini max yeah, like says, it, it asks yeah. you to to pick a decision procedure that performs best at its worst point, right? Yeah. Yeah, and also, uh, like I forgot to mention that. So, uh, it, so when the parameter space is finite, then uh, in uh, so we have this well-known minimax equality, right? So basically, says that is a uh, minimax equals to uh, max min, and there will always exist the least favorable prior that witnesses the mini. Uh, that witnesses this uh, equality, right? And uh, such equality uh, fails if one goes to uh, infinite uh, parameter space. But uh, uh, still, uh, 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 if we use our theorem, then we can show that for any uh, decision problem, this minimax equality always holds, but and there always exists a least favorable uh, non-standard prior. So uh, it's also sort of a, a unified, right? So uh, if one is willing to accept uh, this non-standard framework, then it really doesn't matter whether one is a frequentist or Bayesian because uh, uh, like those two different philosophy schools lead to the same result, as long as one is willing to accept this uh, non-standard framework. Sorry, any other questions or comments? Okay, if not, thank you very much, Kevin. Uh, Great talk, and uh, I'm not sure what the talk is next week. I apologize for that. I I just don't know, but we'll have uh, another seminar next Tuesday at 11. And again, thanks very much, Kevin. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bob. Uh, Thank you, everyone, for coming. Bye-bye. Thank you. Nice talk. Thank you.